on va commencer. Colleagues, could I ask you to take your seats? I'd like to call our meeting to order and we will proceed to item four on our agenda. We are in favor of supporting all of our languages here. I will be speaking in French. We have interpreting into various languages this afternoon so you can find which language you can listen to. So please use them. So this afternoon we have interpreting in English, French, German, Italian, Dutch, Greek, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Hungarian, Polish, Romanian. And we also have interpreting into Arabic and you can find the channel that you would like to use posted around the rooms. That will help you then to follow along with our debate this afternoon. First of all, I would really like to warmly welcome a group of 15 young women and men from Bahrain. They are between 15 and 26 years of age. They are currently conducting a study visit in Brussels within the European institutions as part of the sixth edition of the project Young Parliamentarians. Please feel welcome throughout the course of this entire discussion. And I'd like to invite you all to stay with us throughout the course of the afternoon. Welcome to the Subcommittee on Human Rights. I see that there are a lot of young women. I am a feminist. Keep that in mind. So I'd like to thank all of these young women for being with us this afternoon. Now, in a few days' time, as you all know, at least if you're at all interested in football, that's not actually my case. I am much more interested in human rights than I am in football. Having said that, today we are going to have to deal with both, both of those issues, looking at football and human rights. And we will therefore be talking about the World Cup of Football 2022 in Qatar. Now, Qatar was awarded the World Cup in 2010. And since that point in time, a number of human rights organizations have spoken out against the conditions the working conditions of foreign workers who were recruited to build the stadiums in Qatar. In fact, the European Parliament adopted a resolution in 2013 to express a number of concerns related to this, specifically as pertains to the labor rights and the uh, protections that Qatar should have. Now, Various human rights organizations and diplomatic, mis diplomatic missions in Doha have indicated that thousands of foreign wor workers have died on the construction sites as a result of the building of stadia. Now, there are also reports of discrimination amongst nationalities as well as uh, work-related accidents that were not covered in terms of medical care or because of workers' compensation or insurance cover. And be in Qatar. Now, activity reports of the ILO have outlined that progress has been made and that challenges remain in terms of the implementation of Qatar's labor reforms. One of the most decisive reforms, and that's been supported by the international community, was the end of a mandatory sponsoring, which is known, of, known as kafala a system in the country. So this would have, would mean that workers would be able to have the freedom to change employer, to be protected, as well as to be able to maintain control of their ID uh, papers. Extremely important. Now, we hope that we will be able to have an, a frank and open dialogue on all of these aspects of this issue today in this exchange of views. I think that's how we are better able to understand everything and look at what reforms can be um, expanded on and implemented. It also seems important to me that if we consider how typical this topical this ash issue is. We've seen that the country is under great scrutiny right now, and I'd like to thank all of the organizations for their work. But once this is less topical, once the world has moved on, the lights are out on the World Cup, all of the work that has begun in Qatar to uphold labor rights, I hope that work will continue after this point. So I'd like to thank the ILO. We work regularly with the ILO, and we hope that they will continue to support a number of reforms. They've already been working on them in the country, in Qatar, and more generally uh, in that peninsula. We're 
really pointing the finger at Qatar today in terms of a lack of human rights. But what we've seen is that this is a reality, not just in Qatar, but in many countries in the region. And therefore, it's of utmost importance for our work to continue to serve the purpose of advancing human rights, men and women's rights, workers' rights and labor rights within the context of sporting events, but more generally in the context of all events. Now, we've noted, for example, recently in the COP27 in Egypt, we've seen um, issues with human rights. So it's so dramatic in the country with Abdullah Fattah, who is on hunger strike, hunger strike in the country, and we uh, haven't heard about possible freeing of him. So we have to continue to improve the situation of human rights around the world. Now, we thank the Minister of Labor from the state of Qatar, Mr. Almari, for being here this afternoon. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's really important to point this out because not all ministers accept to come. So I'd like to thank him for being here in person today so that we can have this really frank and open debate. I should also like to thank Mr. Max Tunion for being here. He is head of the International Labour Organiz Organization in Doha, um, as well as Mr. Olgali, who is Secretary General of the International Trade Union, and Minky Warden, who is a Director of Global Initiatives at Human Rights Watch. I'd like to give the floor first and foremost to Hannah Newman, who is the chair of, delegate, of the Delegation for Relations with the Arab Peninsula. You have three minutes to speak. Go ahead. Chair, and I'm happy we are having this discussion today because it clearly shows that if you apply to be in the international spotlight by hosting such an international sports event, well, you are in the international spotlight, not just about how beautiful your country is or how good you are as a host, but also about, for example, your carbon footprint, and the human rights situation in the country. And I'm very happy that we're discussing this here today in the Human Rights Committee. And um, I think the case of Qatar clearly shows that once there is a pressure on human rights, we can also see steps ahead. Um, in terms of the migrant workers' rights, there, is, there are better laws on migrants' workers' rights. And there is, since recently, a minimum wage for migrant workers in Qatar. And we have a central complaints mechanism, and you started um, compensation for some of the workers. Many will say it comes too late, and those that are dead are dead. Yet, it is also part of the truth that we see some improvements. And Mr. Almari, well, first, that you are here. And second, that you have been the head of the human rights organization, the national one, and became now Minister of Labor, I think is a clear political sign of where at least the Qatari leadership wants things to go. Yet, um, our assessment is um, that we still need to work continue working together. First of all, to fully implement the laws, because there are many uh, people who employ people in Qatar that are not a big fan of the end of the kafala system. Um, so a lot of problems continue to fill gaps in the reforms, especially when it comes to domestic workers, um, to increase the pressure on those in the country that do not fully comply with the new rules. Um, and we have a big hope, and we will continue watching to make sure that when the spotlight moves on, so when the World Cup is over, the reforms in Qatar continue at the same speed. Mr. Mari, you will have all our support on that one. Mm -hmm. And also to see whether Qatar will manage to become a bit of a, um, well, a bit of an encouragement to other GCC countries and other countries that still have the kafala system in the region. Also, when it comes to compensation, I think um, the World Cup itself uh, really needs a symbol to clearly show that compensation will go beyond what you and we have, and also maybe some kind of an apology for things that went wrong in the past. Um, but in total, um, I mean, things have changed in Qatar. This just leaves me uh, to one last point. I really hope that the people who will come to Qatar for the Football World Cup, no matter what their sexual orientation is, will have um, the chance to, let's say, um, show their affection to each other as openly as they will show their affection to sports and to football especially. Thank you, Anna. Monsieur le Ministre, si vous... Minister, if you allow, 
you know that I don't always follow protocol to the T. So if you would allow, I should like to give the floor to Minky Warden, who's director of the Global Initiatives at Human Rights Watch. I know that we usually start with the minister. I was minister at one time, and I remember that when it comes to protocol, usually we try to get our word in first. But I'd like to just be a bit creative here in the Subcommittee of Human Rights and give the floor to our experts first, because I think it's good for us to lay the backdrop here as to what we have experienced over recent years. Within that context, I think that all the work that the experts has do has, have, has, have done is really important. So to start the debate, I'd like to ask everyone to stick to six minutes of speaking time. That way we'll be able to have your presentations, yes, but also a debate with the members that are here and it will leave enough time for a question and answers session. Minky, the floor is yours for six minutes to start, if you agree. Thank you very much. For global sport, this year opened with the Winter Olympics in Beijing while the Chinese government was committing crimes against humanity. Then the most recent football World Cup host, Russia, invaded Ukraine. The year will end with Qatar's World Cup, where the spotlight will fall, as it should, on wage theft and unexplained deaths of thousands of migrant workers who built the infrastructure for football's flagship event. FIFA granted Qatar the World Cup tournament in 2010 with no human rights due diligence. FIFA set no conditions about protections for the migrant workers who would be needed to build the massive infrastructure for the tournament. FIFA also failed to examine the human rights concerns for journalists or discrimination that LGBT people, women, and others face in Qatar. In 2016, FIFA adopted the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and in 2017, FIFA passed a human rights policy. Today's discussion is focused on labor, but all human rights are interconnected. Qatar's lack of protections for migrant workers, press freedom, women's rights, LGBT rights, and the country's lack of remedy, including there are no unions and striking is not allowed for migrant workers, and the absence of independent human rights institutions created conditions where serious abuses occurred during the 12 years of World Cup preparation. I will address these abuses and acknowledge some very important steps that have been taken by Qatari authorities and the Labor Ministry. I will also need to highlight how, unfortunately, these reforms remain insufficient to fully prevent further abuses and to provide remedy for those abuses that have occurred, and, above all, to further encourage Qatari authorities and FIFA to improve human rights and labor rights going forward. In Qatar, the male guardianship system rules deny women the right to make key decisions about their lives. Migrant domestic workers can be confined to their employer's home and may be subject to physical and sexual abuse. On LGBT rights, Qatar's Penal Code, Article 285, punishes consensual sexual relations between men with up to seven years in prison. In October, Human Rights Watch published new research that Qatar had arbitrarily arrested six Qatari LGBT people and subjected them to beatings, sexual harassment, and detention. Just last week, Khalid Salman, a 2022 FIFA World Cup ambassador, described homosexuality as damage in the mind. Suggestions by officials that Qatar would make an exception to its abusive laws and practices for outsiders are an implicit reminder that Qatari authorities do not believe LGBT citizens and residents, including migrant workers, deserve these basic rights. Laws in Qatar restrict press freedom and were not reformed as expected in the run-up to the World Cup. Instead, new laws were passed that restricted free speech further. Some international journalists have been detained while reporting ahead of the World Cup in Qatar, forced to confess, and their work has been destroyed. These unacceptable violations of promised press freedom were often tied to reporting on poor living or working conditions for migrant workers on the World Cup infrastructure. And today, Human Rights Watch is publishing a new report that is for reporters who will go to Qatar to cover the World Cup. 
This month, the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy has told Human Rights Watch it will provide shelters and clinics for victims of abuse during the World Cup, including migrant workers. FIFA has given similar assurances, and these are important steps forward. On labor reforms in Qatar, Qatar has introduced several promising reforms over the years, especially after 2017, when it committed to technical cooperation in an agreement with the ILO because of the ILO forced labor complaint in 2014. But these reforms have been limited in their impact due to their late introduction, narrow scope, or gaps in implementation. Human Rights Watch and migrant groups continue to document abuses, including wage abuses, illegal recruitment fees, as well as deaths that continue to be uninvestigated and uncompensated. Qatari authorities have failed to investigate the deaths of thousands of migrant workers, with a large number of which are attributed to so-called natural causes. Most tragically, in these cases, under Qatari labor law, families do not receive any compensation. The controversy around the number of deaths has received the most attention. But a big concern for Human Rights Watch is the high share of unexplained and uncompensated deaths. Human Rights Watch recently interviewed Ram Pukar Sohani, whose father died in Qatar this year. His father died at a construction work site in his work uniform, and there is a photo to verify this tragic case. Even then, his death was reported to be a cardiac arrest, a natural cause, with no investigation into its actual causes. Thus, it was considered non-work related and his family has not been compensated. I'm sorry that migrant workers and the families of workers who died cannot be with us today to tell you about the economic hardship that leads them to send beloved family members away for years and the trauma when they don't return home alive. The Supreme Committee has started encouraging its contractors to adopt life insurance for migrant workers, which provides compensation regardless of the place um, or injuries of death. But this program only began in 2019, applies only to their contractors, and because it is not mandatory, it has been adopted by only 23 contractors. FIFA and Qatar Committing to a remedy fund is not at all at odds with acknowledging the important reforms made by Qatar, especially in the last three years. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and a large global coalition of fans, labor groups, human rights groups, are asking FIFA and Qatar to remedy these abuses by providing financial compensation to workers and their families and to set up a migrant worker center. Thank you very much. Leaving a positive legacy in Qatar after the World Cup includes both continuing the momentum that is already present with labor reforms and compensating those who work to deliver the World Cups before the labor reforms Minister Almari and the ILO will present today. Any discussion of legacy is questionable without retroactive compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Minky. Uh, I give now the floor to Max Tunion, uh, head of office of uh, the uh, ILO in Qatar, in Doha. You have the floor. Six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to share our perspectives from the ILO project office in Doha. Um, as has been mentioned, we've been working in Qatar for the past uh, four and a half years on a comprehensive program of work that was agreed between the government and the ILO and negotiated with the International Trade Union Confederation and the International Organization of Employers. I'll be sharing some of the progress made over the past four years, some of the challenges, and also some reflections. And I hope that we can provide some nuance and context on a debate that is often missing shades of grey. In the past four years, we've seen tangible progress, major developments in terms of new laws and policies, the establishment of new institutions or the enhancement of existing institutions to ensure more effective implementation of these laws and policies. We've seen increased partnerships and engagements with different stakeholders in Qatar and internationally, including with the international trade unions. We've heard already from um, some of the opening remarks about the changes to the kafala system. Um, I, would, I agree with what Minky said, that there are gaps in implementation, but I would disagree in saying that they are narrow in scope that these reforms are narrow in scope. 
In the two years since these changes to the kafala system were introduced, 350,000 workers have changed jobs. That's a significant proportion of the overall labor force. When we talk about the minimum wage, when it was introduced, 280,000 workers saw their wages increase. That's 13% of the workforce. When we talk about the legislation on occupational heat stress protecting outdoor workers, it's reduced the number of workers who have been exposed to heat-related disorders. So, obviously, there are still gaps in implementation, but this has had a concrete impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands. I want to focus on two main uh, reforms. One relates to heat stress, uh, obviously one of the main occupational hazards for workers in Qatar. In 2019, the Minister of Labour, the Supreme Committee and the ILO commissioned the world's largest ever study on the impact of heat on workers' health. And we tested various strategies on how to uh, mitigate uh, heat stress. This was carried out by a team of experts from the University of Thessaly in Greece. This research helped to inform new legislation adopted in 2021, which extends the window in which outdoor work is prohibited. So from 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., from the 1st of June to the 15th of September, all outdoor work is prohibited. In addition to that, there is a threshold at which all work must stop, regardless of the time of day or time of year. In addition, there are uh, uh, more protections. For example, all outdoor workers must undergo annual health screenings, etc. We've seen that this is probably the most progressive legislation on heat stress uh, in the world. And Uh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, we feel that this is probably the most progressive legislation on heat stress in the world, and we have already some indication that it's making a direct impact on workers' uh, health. We track the number of patients admitted to clinics with heat-related disorders each summer, and we saw that this summer there were 351 patients admitted with heat-related disorders. Prior to the introduction of the new legislation, in 2019 and 2020, there were 1,300 and 1,500 workers admitted. So there's been a steep decline, 77% decline, in the proportion of, of workers admitted with heat-related disorders. This is the impact of the reforms. It's also worth spending some time on the issue of, of social dialogue. As was mentioned, Qatar law does not allow foreign workers to form or join trade unions. However, legislation adopted in 2019 allows for elected migrant worker representatives in worker management committees at the enterprise level, a first for the Gulf region. The joint committees are similar to the works councils in Europe, and this is an important first step towards promoting workers' voice and workers' representation. This gradual approach is supported by the international trade unions. From the beginning, the ITUC and global union federations, BWI, IDWF, ITF, and UniGlobal, have been a key part of the reform agenda. They have held meetings every six months with the government of Qatar and the ILO to review progress and set priorities going forward. And in addition to that strategic, strategic level engagement, the global unions have staff on the ground in Doha, also a first for the region. I see that I've already four and a half minutes in, so I'm going to yeah. skip a few parts. And I think this, this um, uh, you know, really to touch on a, a broader point here, it's not only what has been achieved and what has been adopted in terms of legislation or new systems, but how it's been achieved um, with close engagement with the international community, not only the ILO and the international trade unions, but also in dialogue with international NGOs, uh, also with NGOs from across Asia, including Migrant Forum Asia, a huge coalition of NGOs in, in that region, and also exchanging expertise with several European states, including through MOUs that have been signed with Sweden, France, and that are in the pipeline with the Netherlands and Belgium. Now, on to some of the gaps and priorities. I think there is universal recognition that there are gaps in the implementation of the labour reforms. This is not surprising, given their magnitude. It takes time to build institutions, it takes time to change mindsets and to change business practices that have been deeply entrenched. Let me highlight three key priorities for us. One is the full implementation of the kafala reforms. There are still workers who are struggling to change jobs, whether that's through lack of, lack of knowledge on the procedures or sometimes through employers who are retaliating against them when they try to change jobs. Secondly, there is the issue to, uh, of, of wage payments. Now, there are better systems for workers to lodge complaints. In the last 12 months, 34,000 workers lodged complaints, mostly on a, through an online, online platform. They can do also uh, lodge complaints anonymously. And there are new labour courts that have been established. 
uh, but still it can take months for workers to receive their, their due wages. And the third priority is the, uh, to make sure that domestic workers can also fully uh, benefit from these reforms, uh, especially when it comes to the issue of working time and the right for domestic workers to take at least one day off per week. We are all impatient to see the reforms fully applied and enforced. But we also recognize that changes of this scale take time. And we can reflect on how tan tangible progress has been made in the past four or five years. Earlier this year, we commissioned a survey with the Research Institute uh, among 1,000 plus uh, migrant workers, low wage migrant workers. And the workers themselves, 86% of them, said that the reforms have made a positive impact on their lives. Now, Looking forward, everybody recognizes that the World Cup is not the finishing line. We will continue to work with the government, with workers and employers to further advance the reforms in the coming years and further support the alignment of Qatar's law and practice with international labor standards. Thank you very much. Thank you. I give now the floor to Joël Odigi, Secretary General Adjoint of the Confederation Syndicale of the Deputy Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, I would just first let me lean very strongly on the point that um, uh, Max has made uh, because as ITUC uh, we were part of this whole process from the beginning. First to also put on record, in 2014 we were the one that took Qatar to the ILO to make the point that we need this reform to happen. And um, let's also put it on, um, on record that indeed as trade unions we see ourselves as uh, Oliver Twist uh, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> We like what we see, um, but it's not enough. We want to go back and ask for more. And uh, first to say what we see, they are commendable. The reform to, uh, to the kafala system, we appreciate it. The, the, the minimum wage, uh, every worker likes a minimum wage. Um, clearly, we, we always make the argument that wages should not be inserted in competition. And so when you have minimum wage, that's one way of taking wage out of competition. So we are excited about it. We're excited about the occupational health and safety reforms that have been made by Qatar, uh, which is contributing to the reduction of debts. In February this year, a, a delegation of uh, trade unions from Africa visited Qatar. We visited Doha. And we spoke to quite a number of uh, migrant workers, especially our brothers and sisters. Africans are in large population working in Qatar. And they gave us uh, their uh, uh, stories. And what came out in the summary of it is that they have seen remarkable improvement from what it was before and what is it, it is uh, today. As trade unions uh, who wanted to see reform in Qatar, we are concerned and interested in consolidating the gains that have been made. Uh, in recent time, we begin to see um, what manner of report that tends to want to put the gains we have made in jeopardy? And we think if this is not halted, it's not going to do uh, us any good. Importantly, um, there are beginning to be a, a narrative that is, you know, swelling uh, that tends to say this whole criticism is not about the migrant workers. It's not about improving situation. First, it's about pursuing vendetta. And then also you can see that it's also about uh, cropping up racism. I'm an African. I know what it is when you talk about racism, uh, institutional, historical. And uh, if you have that and that begins to um, uh, have a, sp a space and a dominance in the process, then clearly you are going to decapitate the gains that have been made. Uh, we want to really put that on record that that needs to, uh, to change. And it's more worrisome, especially when, uh, like, especially before we visited, we had about 6,000 something dead. We were very strong. When we visited Qatar and we visited the ILO office and we spoke to the people, the figures don't match the reality that have been put in, the, in, in that point. But why not uh, taking issues with those who have uh, uh, put the figure out? We encourage the office. Can you try to do, in course of this work, show the reality? And uh, we think the ILO has also done that a bit, but we see a culture of doubling down. Uh, even when you provide the information, people then move to disinformation, to double down. And when you have that, for us, our concern is that our, these gains then 
become a problem. And when we say this consciously, because we are talking about the Middle East that does not have, you excuse me, and uh, Honorable Minister, you excuse me, the culture of democracy is different in the Middle East. It's a society that is monarchical, largely. And if you want to force a change, that's a gradualist approach that also works. When people have made concession, encourage them, push them further. Don't scandalize the process as if nothing has happened, nothing has been done. That brings uh, a bit of problem. Yes, as trade unions, we have concern too of certain things we want to see change. Um, we, we think as trade unions, we cannot defend workers' rights if there are no trade unions. So uh, the good thing we see is that workers' representative can sue one step in the right direction. We want to encourage Qatar, can we move to the formation of trade unions? Uh, 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 gradually, that's something we want to see. On the issue of wage theft, we have seen an improvement in using uh, electronic means to uh, pay salaries and all of that, but we still think there is a need for better supervision of the process because certain persons are still falling, are falling off. Then also, there is the issue of a family reunion. When we visited our people there, including Asians, we saw that the arrangement can benefit uh, the workers' morale and, and you know, well-being can improve socially if there is some provision for a family reunion. Lastly, and uh, the, um, uh, I, I we uh, pause here to say what the ILO is doing is something we want to seriously encourage. Uh, the idea of working with Qatar through a social dialogue process we are happy, as of today, our trade unions are on the ground in Qatar, offices organizing, representing workers, work, uh, you know, trying to improve the situation on the ground. We hope and we wish we can see this in the United Arab Emirates. We hope, we wish we can see this in Saudi Arabia, because for us, these are bigger economies in the Middle East. Uh, you do not want to force water from the, uh, from the, uh, from the valley to the hill. It is better uh, if the water is trickling down from the hill down to the valley. These bigger economies should come to the plate. And we hope that this committee can help us to do that. And if we have a situation where the attack uh, is just uh, about chipping away at the gains that have been made, our fear is that these bigger economies that we are, we are targeting might get scared and say, oh, if you can do that to Qatar, then don't come near me. So the idea is how do we push everybody in a supportive, encouraging uh, uh, manner. Of course, when we need to bring out the stick, we should do so. But it should be in a sense to improve uh, the situation. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joël. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, je vais... Minister, I'll give you the floor. Minister for Labour. In Qatar, you were president of the Human Rights Commission in Qatar, and I know that you are uh, very keen on the uh, human rights issues as former president, but I know also that your fight within the government and within uh, Qatari society is not easy. I think we need to underline that, along with what's just been said, the fact that our aim is to support efforts that can be made, that are being made, that must be made, that have been made in this area. So I'll give you the floor now. I don't know whether you'll be speaking English or Arabic. Please let us know so that people can choose uh, their channel and put our headphones on. Thank you. OK. Uh... First of all, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for this invitation and uh, uh, for this very important discussion. And really, I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, the Chair of DARB about uh, their uh, uh, interventions and uh, our colleague from the uh, Human Rights Watch and ILO and uh, uh, ITUC Africa. And uh, I would like uh, from you, really, uh, I'm uh, prepare my, uh, my, uh, my speech in English, but uh, uh, I will transfer to speak Arabic if you allow me. If I, for that, uh, I think uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, everybody to uh, transfer for the Arabic language. 
uh, to begin with, before I became Labour Minister, I worked for about 18 years in the field of human rights, and I was an activist in human rights. And uh, in the last 10 years, I was also heading the National Human Rights Committee in Qatar, and I was also the General Secretary of the International Alliance for Human Rights Societies Worldwide. So I do know the role of the human rights activists, and I do realize what are the challenges regarding human rights, whether they are in our countries, in the Arab countries, in Qatar specifically, or in other uh, countries worldwide, whether they are in Europe or elsewhere. And to be honest with you, when I was heading the National Human Rights Committee, in Qatar, there has been many recommendations and many uh, criticism that I formulated myself against the government in my country. And this is exactly what my colleagues have just done now. However, being in my capacity of Labour Minister, of course, this is very helpful in me uh, pushing forward this agenda and these reforms to make them materialize in actual facts, as my colleagues have spoken about the reforms, indeed uh, there are reforms that have been started. We had many challenges. There has been many recommendations uh, that uh, uh, were um, uh, articulated but not implemented. And uh, the colleagues from the ILO, from the ITUC, they did say that there are uh, reforms, but these reforms face obstacles. There were there are a number of reforms that have been requested. We started on the journey. Sometimes uh, we say that reforms are enacted, but implementation is lacking. And uh, but we do confirm. I do confirm that there are a string of reforms, and there is a series of initiatives to implement them in the field. However, uh, there are gaps, indeed, uh, facing these uh, reforms and their implementation. Specifically, the reforms have been undertaken in a very short span of time. So, I mean, this is only natural that we face difficulties. And this is what my ILO has said, my colleague. He said, that's a question of mindset as well. I mean, Nobody can say suffice to enact laws that they happen. I mean, you need to change the atmosphere, the environment, and uh, the mindset. And we are continuing such efforts. Now, from the start, Qatar has always been an open country. I mean, we have the policy of open doors to all those who want to visit. There has been always channels of communication between Qatar and the other stakeholders. Qatar is among the few countries that open the doors to, do, to, to, some, to some organizations such as Human Rights Watch, for example. So we, uh, there, has, there are about 17 agreements between... Oh, in 2017, there was an agreement between the ILO and our country. And there is a serious discussion between Qatar and uh, international trade unions as well. These international trade union federation, confederation, for example, have uh, been a consultative body to us. We have always been welcoming positive, constructive criticism. However, International organizations always wonder, I mean, if these reforms are only linked to the run-up to the World Cup or will they be continuing afterwards once the spotlights are uh, 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 shut down? So I can tell you that the reforms in the pipeline are based on the Qatar vision of 2030. This vision does state clearly that there needs to be reforms connected to the topics at issue at hand. The World Cup obviously had sped up somehow, but these reforms are not linked. It's not the reason, I mean, the reason for that is not the World Cup, but it is part and parcel of the Vision 2030. In October, uh, last October, there was a meeting 
I met all the international federations in Qatar and colleagues from ILO were present. Human Rights was also uh, participating in other NGOs. And we uh, spoke about our vision post-World Cup. Last week I was in Geneva and I had a meeting with the, uh, the ILO uh, general director. That meeting aimed at continuing cooperation and projects post-World uh, uh, Cup. And there are discussions underway as we speak to make sure that the uh, ILO office in Doha is now uh, 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 provisional, and there are discussions to make it a standing office of the ILO in Doha. So we are also uh, all aiming at pr setting up what we call the uh, dialogue of Doha on an annual basis, specifically talk about the migrant workers and related items from uh, migrant workers from Africa. So there is going cooperation, there is going to be a standing annual channel of communication, and all these indicate that these reforms will continue post World Cup, and it is tightly linked to the vision of Qatar 2030. All the speakers have said that there are reforms. Now, with regard to the compensations or the remedies to compensate the victims and the is an ethical duty before being a statutory or legal uh, aspect. So there are views, views are different. Some NGOs uh, said that we should have a remedy fund uh, for uh, to compensate victims. We are against this initiative and creating a new mechanism because the legal framework in Qatar today does state for uh, funds. We, in 2018, compensation fund has been created and we have paid $350 million so far in the last period as compensation the remedies. And therefore, we are not against remedies and compensating. There are mechanisms. And from this very rostrum, we call upon all the unions, uh, human rights uh, organizations, if they have names of victims, of workers who have not been compensated, well, we do have the, the fund and we are completely ready to compensate and to make up for the loss. For the loss. And, uh, and therefore, from this restaurant, we really call upon any of you to question me. Well, obviously, time is running out. And uh, Miss Maria, I will try to uh, speak as in a summary. My colleague from ITUC has said that that we do not want to uh, close the door to constructive criticism. Absolutely not. However, there should not be any politicizing. I mean, using some misinformation, uh, specifically of figures of the victims of the deaths. And so we've spoken about 15,000, 10,000. Uh, so these are inaccurate figures. And therefore, we call upon the specialist to refer to the uh, uh, genuine sources, which is the ILO and the ITUC. Uh, my colleague has spoke about discrimination. Well, we do accept uh, uh, specifically any criticism is welcome. Somebody spoke about racism and, uh, and hate speech. Obviously, such narrative is not going to uh, favor the continuation of the reforms. There are some media, unfortunately, who said that the, the Qataris uh, are a bunch of, the Qatari nationals are a bunch of uh, criminals, of terrorists. I mean, how can we accept such narrative of hatred speech, hatred speech, and also this racism that is obviously 
it's a name and shame basically against us and based on this we do call upon all these organizations, all human rights, to condemn, to denounce such campaign, smear campaigns against our country. So we have to be fair in condemning all sides. So this is basically what I wanted to say in a nutshell. However, if there are any specific uh, questions, I am ready to uh, uh, reply. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll give the floor straight to my colleagues. We have a lot of uh, names on the list, so I'm going to ask you to stick to the time one minute only. So, Peter Van Dahl for the EPP first. Thank you very much. Well, the World Football Championship 2022 should never have ended up in Qatar. We know what um, workers' rights are like in Qatar. And we know that hundreds of people have died, and that only confirms my opinion. It should never have gone there. There's a huge amount of corruption, of course, in who gets the World Cup. The 16 people involved in the FIFA decision have been linked to corruption. Mr Platini, for instance, also apparently did everything he could to ensure that uh, French support was received. So, in practice, is there really no um, forced labour anymore? Um, I'm wondering if it's still going on. My question to the Minister, if you will allow it. Why don't you allow European inspections? Let's see that. Allow us to monitor you, the new situation also. Thank you, Peter. Andrea Cozzolino, one minute. Grazie, grazie di questa... Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, I have some football principles that leads me to question the world Cup because we know that in 2020 Italy won't be there and uh, my, my team Naples is not playing as well as I'd like to see them. But joking aside, coming back to the principles, labor dialogue, aside from that, there are no initiatives ongoing, uh, nationally speaking, in the run up to the World Cup. But there is this social dialogue with the international uh, organizations and with the trade unions, etc. We need to encourage this. We need to encourage this program of, of reforms. And it would be a real shame with the World Cup coming up for us in this institution and in the European Parliament if we were to erect barriers to these types of undertakings. So we really should encourage this program, have more clarity on the data, that's important, uh, specifically on three subjects that we are focusing on, working conditions, the issue of wages, and finally, uh, to make sure that we have a stronger trade union presidents in the country. So finally, this is the question. How can we get the EP and more involved in the negotiations that the minister rec uh, referred to? So not just international institutions, uh, uh, not international organizations, but also the EP. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I definitely see the reforms um, being made to improve the working conditions, um, such as the introduction of a minimum wage or laws that limit working hours in extreme heat, but it's clearly not enough. Um, I am familiar with some of your comments being made in different interviews. Um, I know that you have objection when it comes to the fund. Um, I know that you're even asking where are the victims, do you have names of the victims. I know that you speak about certain racist motivations um, and I know that you also mention it as, for example, pu publicity stunt. But this is, of course, about guaranteeing human rights and the fundamental rights of people. 
And what I would seriously like to know from the Minister is um, how will your government ensure that the rights of LGBTI plus people, but also women, are guaranteed? So how will you protect their rights? Because as you know, there is a structural problem, there is an issue um, with guaranteeing these fundamental rights of women LGBTI plus uh, people. So what are you going to do about it concretely? Thank you. Thank you. Anna Miranda for the Greens. Sí, gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, greetings to the families of the victims, the um, laborers who have died for because of money, because of corruption, because of FIFA's decisions, who wanted to hold uh, the World Cup in Qatar, whatever happened, despite the fact that uh, human rights are not respected. They died uh, through exploitation because there are conditions of slavery uh, as the uh, Human Rights Organization representative said. And I wonder, what is the position of the EEAS? We don't have a representative of the FIFA here either. They should be here to provide explanations, not just yourselves, the Qatari government and the NGOs. It's FIFA who is primarily responsible for having laundered this whole situation. And it's sad because when it comes right down to it, football buys anything. Corruption can buy anything. But you won't buy us or the memories of the victims. Miguel Urban Crespo. Thank you, Chairman. Last week we heard that FIFA has banned the Danish team from training in Qatar with a T-shirt that said human rights for all because they believe this is a political message and that is banned. So holding a football World Cup in a country uh, which uh, uh, whose uh, rules run counter to 20 of the 30 UN rights, uh, human rights standards Qatar believes that women are un human are being are beings under the protection of men and that homosexuality merits prison. They also ban trades unions and political parties. And we're seeing an example of how these large events, particularly sports events, are used to launder the image of uh, certain countries. We are talking about a World Cup which has been bathed in blood and that's a political message which for many and for many of us this will be a World Cup of shame. We express our solidarity with women with LGBT uh, plus people and I therefore have to express my support for the boycott of the World Cup. Costas Paradakis. Many people lost their lives, have been wounded. 90% uh, of the work done on the World Cup uh, infrastructure was done by migrant workers. We're talking about business worth millions of euros. Um, with uh, FIFA and so on, the str strikes and uh, trades union organisations are banned uh, and the Labour minister is, we hear, a former member of an NGO. The European Union's attitude, actually, is hypocritical. It's very positive that many sports people and supporters are expressing their uh, opposition to this situation. Families of victims must be compensated. They should be compensated. This is the only way forward 
to protect rights and freedoms. Thank you. So we have additional speakers from other groups. Lara Walters. Thank you, Marie. Um, I do think this is the World Cup of shame, and I think it's good that it got said. Whenever I see a football pitch, it always strikes me how small a football pitch is, um, and I find the contrast so huge between the smallness of the pitch and the huge suffering and corruption that such a pitch can instigate. What we're doing here today is truth-seeking, I suppose. I read newspapers, I watch documentary, I attend meetings like this. Um, where I come down on things, all co things considered, is um, are things better? Yes, they are. Are things good? No, absolutely not. And I see two structural problems. One problem is I think that the Qatari government is very keen on reaping the financial and reputational benefits of this World Cup and that the international community can provide via this World Cup. But the other side of the medal here, the other side of those benefits, um, is the scrutiny that the international community uh, unleashes for such a World Cup. And it is right scrutiny, or it's rightly so, that we're doing that. And I see extreme reluctance on this scrutiny. And I want to say you cannot have one without the other. The second is second. from a UN report. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Now, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on uh, Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia said, described in 2020 Qatar, in Thank Qatar, you. a de facto Thank caste you, system based on national origin, I'll, I'll wrap up soon, um, which results in structural discrimination. And coming from that, I think that yes, things are a lot better, sure. but Thank I want you. to make sure that that marking point um, is taken Thank into you, account. Laha. I have if sorry, you... sorry, I, I can't because we have other people wanted to have the floor, so I can't. Can give we do you a second time. round with so, questions? Yeah, but <laughs> it would have Can been I ask to at have least your about before. the the detainees of the arrest uh, in August of 2022? Amaya, no, yeah, yeah. So we go, we go to the next one. So um, Jose Ramon Paus. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you to all those who are here on the podium, particularly the minister for his background and because he's responsible uh, for the area of labour in Qatar. The most recent reports of the International Labour Organization, which is the specialist UN organization on this, are positive and say that there has been significant progress, as our speakers said. And I want to highlight the fact that the Qatar World Cup is a good example of sports diplomacy. Look at the region, countries which months ago, uh, a year ago, were blocking things. They're now cooperating together. And there are things that the parliament can uh, bring, uh, the Abraham Accords and, and blockages on that and so on. We are actually getting significant progress with the Commission and the GCC Council. We have a recent visit from high representatives of the EU. And I think in the European Parliament, we should just stop always blocking and open paths forward for dialogue. Because if we get in our own way like this, we won't progress and we'll be a poor example from uh, the countries in the re for the countries in the region thank you uh, wir haben heute viel über nuancen gesprochen über die definition von umsetzungsschritten über reformen über we talked about the uh, definition um, of reforms and what we mean and the changes everything is uh, all of this is welcome but what's happening as far as i'm concerned is um, those guest workers, those migrants who went to Qatar for a better life and then ended up dead. Um, let's remember them. We're talking um, about compensation. We have a moral obligation to compensate the families, but we should have actually compensated them if they had not died. And my question is, how can we guarantee that compensation will actually be paid? How, Minister, can we ensure this? Can we rely on this? How can all of us here, including the sport groups and the political responsibilities, answer this? Thank you. Thank you for your minutes. Uh, Dietmar Koester. Thank you very much. Since I'm nine years old, 
I always watched the men's FIFA World Cup. It was always a highlight for me as a football fan. But how can I enjoy watching a football match in a stadium which was built on the life of migrant workers and under unhuman working conditions? I'm really fed up with this kind of mafia organization called FIFA. So it is impossible to watch these matches with joy. I will refrain from watching. At least 600 and 500 migrant workers died since Qatar was named the host for the men's FIFA World Cup. Qatar promised to improve the working conditions, and as we heard, they were made some progress, but not enough has been made. And so, what can be done that labor migrants and their families receive full and adequate reparations? Really, can you promise that this will happen for the migrant workers? This would be a very important sign. Thank you. Thank you, Dietmar. Alessandra Moretti. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much. شكرا السيدة الرئيسة أنا أعتقد أن الرياضة ينبغي أن تكون مكبر صوت عظيم وهي فرصة كبرى من أجل أن نؤكد عن حقوق الإنسان وعن دفاع عن الحريات والتقدم الذي نحصل عليه أنا أطلب من الزملاء من البرلمان أن لا يستخدموا دائما نفس الطريقة لأن هذا ما قمنا به مع روسيا عندما نظمت فعاليات السابقة للعبر المياه الشتوية وأيضا الكوب 27 في مصر الميكروفون English okay. So you have to go to English No, 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 it's fine English is on The English channel is on Quindi un grande so it should be a major megaphone, but also we should use the same method today. The COP27 is in Egypt. In Italy, we have not received any information on Regini and what his outcome was or any reassurance about the procedure. And when it comes to working conditions, um, uh, in Italy, we know that we've had a number of deaths in Italy alone in this context, Italy being a European country. We should be hard on Qatar when we ask them to respect human rights and labor rights, but we must also make sure defend it when they're making progress compared to other countries. A question, Minister. The ambassador who spoke on homosexuals stating that uh, it is an illness. I think that you should take a stringent position on this, a penalty even, so that you can make clear the road that you are willing to take on this subject. Thank you. One minute, je te coupe. One minute, Matabella. I'm going to cut you off if you go longer. Merci, Président. Thank you. Well, I'll be brief. I didn't really intend to take the floor, but listening to the colleagues, I was thinking what Mr. Odigi said. I think we should support him, of course. Lots of colleagues, you know, uh, 2014, 2018, we didn't have all of this when we were talking about uh, Sochi or uh, Beijing or when the World Cup went there. Um, I think there's a 10, uh, an image that's or a picture that's 10 years old. The only resolution was in in the parliament was 2012 when we looked at the difficult situation of deplorable conditions for workers in some cases and since then reforms have been undertaken and the situation uh, was no longer a preoccupation for us so what I'm saying today is that if you look at an old picture 10 years ago um, we need to actually respect uh, the journey and what's happened since then thank you so, I am going to ask a question to the Minister. You said that a number of European companies today are in Qatar and they are not respecting the rules established in Qatar. Can you quote the name of these? I know that there are 11. I'd like to know if you could tell us the names of those European companies who are not um, ascribing to the minimum regulations set down by Qatar. Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, First of all, I'd like to uh, just say how happy I am to hear all those uh, interventions and Qatar is with and for constructive criticism. Without constructive criticism, we have never been able to uh, achieve uh, 
this, uh, these big, big reforms. You've put long questions. Before answering all of them, I'd I'd like to address those who call for the boycott of the Qatari World Cup. So my question, have you ever boycotted any previous iterations of the World Cup in the past? Why do you focus only on the one that is organized in Qatar? So this is this is my question to you. Have you have you watched all of the previous iterations or not. So I'm here talking about just the previous one in 2018, for example. Your questions. You spoke, or many of you spoke about the different sexual orientations. So here, uh, as a representative of the Qatari government, I'm not here to judge upon each and everyone's sexual orientations. I just would like to uh, confirm that each and every one of you is welcomed in Qatar to attend the matches. This is the highest level communication from the chief of state in Qatar. So this is a very clear answer to those questions. Now talking about compensations. For this chapter, we have not accepted to turn a blind eye on any victim. It's painful, and every victim is painful. And of course, there is a mechanism to which everyone can resort in order to uh, seek remedy and get compensation. Now, on the front of numbers and the number of dead, you have one day a newspaper talking about 6,500 victims, another one 10,000, and a third one talks about 15,000, as if there were a competition between newspapers. Who's going to say more? But I can confirm that, and this is seconded by specialized agencies and organizations, that if, as a politician, you want the right information, you should look for the right source of information. And who is the right source of information? You have the ILO, and you have the ITUC. Not to mention the fact that ILO lodged a complaint against Qatar in 2014. Maybe this is a proof of integrity. And uh, talking about compensation fund or migrant worker fund. It is a mechanism. I think it's ranked seventh in the world in terms of volume. There is no such fund for workers in the region at that level. And as I said, at least a $350 million envelope has been uh, given as a compensation to workers. And to conclude, I just say that we will, despite criticism, constructive or not, carry on on the path of reforms. And of course, I, I can understand that some lack proper information. That's why they they speak about boycott. They speak about violations victims. Maybe they lack the proper information. So I call upon them to look for that information from the right source. But of course, I would reiterate, each and every one is welcomed in Qatar. And I can confirm you that the Qatar World Cup will be the best iteration in 
uh, football history. Thank you very much indeed. And still, I'm saying that we're ready for constructive criticism. Thank you. I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Anario from the uh, head delegation for the Arab Peninsula. You have two minutes. Thank you. Here at the back. The situation of foreign workers and the ongoing labour reforms are key elements for the EU's bilateral engagement with Qatar, featuring prominently in our political and human rights dialogue. Our latest, the fourth round, took place on September 12 in Brussels with very positive outcome. We have welcomed the different reforms in this regard, making Qatar the first country in the Gulf to formally dismantle the kafala or sponsorship system, which grants excessive powers to the employer over the employee. We have also welcomed Qatar's adoption of the region's first non-discriminatory minimum wage covering all migrant workers, including domestic workers. There has been progress, but challenges remain. There is a resistance to the reforms by parts of the society and segments of the business community, including on part of uh, Western multinationals operating in Qatar. I think your question was very relevant in this regard. There are gaps in implementation. Despite the minimum wage legislation and government efforts, numerous migrant workers have, been, have seen their wages or work allowances being cut or not paid at all. And living conditions of many migrant workers need to, need to be improved. There is a need for much better collection of data on work-related fatalities and injuries. The EU continues to encourage the Qatari authorities to improve workers' living conditions, mm -hmm. to facilitate access to justice, to ensure payment of wages and effective labour inspections. And the EU will continue to engage with Qatar on these issues to help promote sustainability of ongoing reforms and their continuation after the World Cup. Vice President Hinas and Commissioner Smith discuss labour rights regularly with Qatari leaders, notably with His Excellency um, Minister Almari, who has visited us a number of times since his appointment. And this is in itself a sign of sincere engagement from the Qatari side. The EU is in close contact with the ILO office in Doha to support both politically and technically further labour reforms in the country. And I wish to thank Mr. Tunyon and his team for the great cooperation also on behalf of our colleagues in Doha in the newly established EU delegation to the state of Qatar. The EUSR for Human Rights, Mr. Gilmer, has engaged extensively on labour rights and World Cup preparations during his visit to Qatar in February 2020 and through his follow-up exchanges with the ILO office in Doha and the chair of the National Human Rights Committee of Qatar. The European Union will continue to follow the human rights situation in the country very closely through our annual human rights and political dialogues with the government, through our newly established EU delegation and through the embassies of our member states. And we stand ready to support and assist Qatar in its human rights reform agenda and to do our part in the common endeavour to make this a success story for Thank this you. country and for the rest of the GCC beyond the World Cup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alors, je pense qu'on a tous... Uh... Okay, I think it's uh, frustrating for all of us today in this debate we've just been having, but I would like to thank the Minister for taking part today. It's not easy, but you've seen the extent to which human rights and workers' rights is important. Um, a lot of people like football, but they're still very concerned about human rights. Personally, I'm not so such a fan. But I am going to give everybody one minute. I'm going to cut you off at one minute. We have another important debate coming up, which is the Vanuatu Initiative, which is an initiative taken by an island that is now being overwhelmed by climate uh, change is being flooded. So climate and human rights, both big issues there. But please, you all have one minute. I'm going to cut you off. I am going to start with Human Rights Watch. One minute. 
Thank you very much. And um, Minister Almari, we very much respect the important role that you had before on human rights and that you have now and that you can still play. You ask for names and we have names of many families of those who have died. And I wanted to say the story of Ram Kushan Sahani. Um, his father has, uh, his father has died, his son has died and he said, after my son died, things have been very difficult. How will I take care of two kids, my grandchildren, my wife and I? So we have many of these names. We have the, the families that are trying to survive with the loan sharks. The, the um, Workers Support and Insurance Fund correctly has compensated more than $350 million. Would you be prepared to extend that retrospectively so that families of workers who have died could claim. So far, it only is about wage theft. And of course, we have, ex we have reported extensively on this. Can we Thank ask you. you to consider to extending Thank it retrospectively? Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to Max Tagnon. Tagnon. Sorry. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, look, I think everybody knows that the ILO works on these complex, deep-rooted uh, issues all over the world, including with the support of the European Union on fundamental principles and rights at work. It's, there are no quick fixes. It's always a challenge. But I think what we've seen in Qatar is something rare. We rarely see change happening at this pace. And of course, it's not finished. The job will continue. But I think it's also important to recognize the progress. To your question, uh, Chair, about uh, European companies. I'm not going to name and shame any, but I will point to one um, uh, intervention that has been developed over the past few years, the joint committees. These are currently voluntary at the moment, these works councils. Uh, but every conversation we have with every company in Qatar that we meet is to establish joint committees. This is the one thing you can do to demonstrate your commitment to the reforms and demonstrate leadership. Nine times out of ten, we don't hear from those companies again, including European companies. European companies that provide those rights for worker representation here in Europe, but don't extend those same privileges and rights to workers in Qatar. Finally, there is more information out there. There's a lot of information on our website. There's a lot of data. The Ministry is publishing data every month. We published an annual report which is very Thank comprehensive you. and is used Thank by Human Rights Watch, Amnesty and other NGOs in their reporting. So Thank there is you, more Max. out there for those who are interested. Thank, Thank you. you, Max. Thank you. I give the floor to uh, Joël Odigi. You Thank have you. the last. Um, as a trade unionist worker, a campaign is what we do. Since 2010, precisely, uh, South Africa woke up to date we have been campaigning around FIFA events to try to uh, use it as opportunity to protect rights. Never uh, have we seen uh, a serious international focus on this work up. For us, it's a plus. We welcome it, and it has helped us to advance gain. But I want to take the words that we have made here, especially on climate change and World Cup. COP27 is happening. And uh, we are almost uh, 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 at the. We would have been excited if human rights has also gone in from the very beginning. Uh, Egypt, uh, uh, in Africa, is not. We do not have a trade union there. Uh, the United Arab Emirates will be op hosting COP28. We will love this house to stay this focus around human rights and climate change and using global events to target human rights issues. I thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je... Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in this debate. And let me say I'm very happy Mr. Volter is here because he's in charge of the due diligence file, which is um, up to companies. The companies, the state companies, need to respect human rights here. And it's absolutely essential that there be such laws. And hopefully Qatar will continue to improve um, companies via and being inspected via due diligence is another way of respecting human rights. And I hope that everyone who has been very active on that matter will continue to be so in the due diligence debate that we will keep having, having uh, in the future in this parliament. Thank you.